They hastily built a crude cabin east of their find, but nevertheless went on to prospect throughout the northern hills, only to return on November 8, 1875, to post a claim of their discovery. On the very next day, November 9, 1875, a second group filed a claim just short of three miles up the creek. This outlined a stretch that was destined to become known as the richest placer claim area, not only in North America, but the entire Western Hemisphere. As news of this bonanza leaked out, the rush was on, resulting in a flood of mankind from all directions. The army could no longer stop the invasion of the fortune hunters. By August 2nd of 1876, Deadwood Gulch, now known as Deadwood City, and often referred to as Sin City, had acquired a worldwide reputation as a booming metropolis. Its surrounding hills and creeks were loaded with gold. Even greenhorns were said to be able to find nuggets, uh, well, as they put it, bigger than horse turds. Its streets were lined with substantial businesses, offering everything from an opera house to dance halls, saloons and banks, stores of every sort, but mainly <laughs> saloons and gambling dens. Deadwood Gulch was jam-packed with every variety of mankind, good and bad. The likes of Wild Bill Hickok, Seth Bullock, Wyatt Earp, Calamity Jane, Colorado Charlie Utter, California Joe, and Preacher Smith. Somewhere between four to 6,000 of them. They came with greed or lust and high ideals, but the frenzied excitement that Deadwood provided well satisfied their pioneer spirits. Two guys named Nuttall and Mann couldn't picture themselves seeking their fortune as prospectors and instead built a house on their placer claim, number 10, which became known as Saloon Number 10. On the morning of August 2nd, 1876, Harry Young was tending bar in the number 10. His hair was greased as was customary for bartenders in gold camps. This was essential as part of a method used by bartenders to collect a little extra loot for themselves. Before reaching into a prospector's poke for a pinch of gold to collect for a given whiskey, the bartender would rub his fingers through his greasy hair, thus oiling them well. He would deposit the unoiled gold dust into the boss's tail, and by again rubbing his fingers through his hair, redeposit the oily flakes where it could be washed out later. It's said that there was a bald-headed barkeep who was known to have half a dozen hair pieces, all well-oiled. His take was enormous, as the laundering process was more efficient. The dance hall girls had arrived on Colorado Charlie Utter's wagon train in late June, ready and willing to entertain the thousands of eligible prospectors. Some came with hopes of finding the right man. Others came simply to make their own fortune. Their attire, somewhat more revealing than what was thought to be proper, was looked down upon by those trained in ladylike etiquette. But nonetheless, they brought to the gold rush an air of reckless, dazzling excitement. By August 2nd, 1876, they were well established up and down Deadwood City's main street, working around the clock in one fashion or the other. Honky Tonk Piano and their songs of promising spirit filled the air. Many an unlucky prospector could find hope for tomorrow, for he knew what the night would bring. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Wild Bill Hickok entered saloon number 10, seeking a little poker action. Charlie Rich, a gambler from Cheyenne, Carl Mann, owner of saloon number 10, and Captain Massey, a riverboat captain from Missouri, were engaged in a game of draw poker and were quick to invite Bill to join them. While Bill's reputation demanded that he be exceedingly cautious. For instance, he never liked to sit with his back to the door. The vacant seat was so located and a lively debate between Charlie Rich and Charlie, Bill resulted I'm in an attempt on Bill's part to get Charlie's chair. Come on, I need that chair, you know I can't sit here. Bill was not given his request, and grudgingly, with great hesitation, took the empty chair. But after a few minutes, he stood up and again asked Charlie for his chair. I'm real uncomfortable here. Charlie, I need that chair. <laughs> Bill didn't win this argument either, and on this rare occasion, he settled down, sitting with his back to the door. Wariness, though, kept Bill alert. 
for all knew him to be a left-handed drinker, leaving his right hand free to handle his pistol. As unpredictable as card games are, Bill found himself quickly losing to Massey, who had lost to Bill the night before. Bill asked Harry for $15 worth of pocket checks. Harry brought them over to Bill and returned to the bar and his duties. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm in. Two of them. Soon, a shifty drifter known as Jack McCall entered the saloon. Bill quickly turned while drawing his gun. Recognizing McCall as a newcomer to town, he greeted him with a friendly, Howdy, Jack. Bill. Then reholstered his gun and resumed the game. Jack slowly circled the table, pausing briefly behind each player and analyzing each hand. While Bill's attention was on Massey, there was a friendly argument between them, and while Bill remarked, Massey, I am taking you tonight, no doubt about it. Upon returning directly behind Wild Bill, suddenly Jack McCall. Take that, damn you! <laughs> Don't let you move! The bullet struck Bill in the back of the head, coming out of his left cheek and lodged in Captain Massey's left arm. It was discovered soon after the cards Bill was holding were aces and eights, forever known as the dead man's hand. All fled the saloon except Carl Mann, who was held at bay by McCall. Jack snapped the trigger of his gun several times. It failed to fire. He then ran out the door and up the street. He was found hiding in a building behind a butcher shop. Later on in the day, he was tried in a miner's court. The jury, being tainted and influenced by a deceitful defense, found McCall not guilty, and he was released. This decision not only outraged the judge, but also the general populace. McCall left the camp in haste. Upon reaching supposed safety in Wyoming, he began bragging of his ignoble deed. Word of this reached a U.S. Marshal who tracked McCall down, arrested him, and sent him to Yankton to be tried again in Dakota Territory. It was determined, since the first trial was held in Indian Territory, that it was not legal. McCall was found guilty and hung for his cowardly crime. He was buried in an unmarked grave on the edge of town. Later, as the town grew, the cemetery was moved. As the coffins were opened, one corpse was found with a rope around its neck. It was easily identified as Jack McCall, the assassin of Wild Bill. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.